This is the Flyerdelphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com, with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heening. Hello, Flyers fans, and welcome back to the Flyerdelphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com. I'm your host, Kevin Durso, joined by Rob Riches and Dan Heening. And so the free agent frenzy is over, and the Flyers have come away from the open of free agency with one new addition, and it was a big one. The Flyers signed forward James Van Riemsdyk, originally a second overall selection by the Flyers in 2007, to a five-year, $35 million deal. Aside from that, the bigger story was probably the departures from the team. We'll get into a few of those in a little while, and we'll also get into where a few other free agents landed, specifically a few of the players we discussed in the last week as potential targets going into free agency. But let's start with the return of JVR and what this means for the Flyers. And guys, my initial thought was a little bit of surprise to this. JVR fills a need. I don't think there's any arguing that. But to see the Flyers do the term of five years and the cap hit of seven million stood out to me. In the immediate there's nothing wrong with it. Next season, you have $21 million in cap space available. You might as well put some of that to use. But knowing what they will be facing in a few years by having to re-sign their own players, the term of the cap hit honestly struck me as a little bit of a risk. It worried me a little bit. And then that said, if you do want to get better immediately, you do have to take a bit of a risk. And the Flyers did that. For Ron Hextall to make this deal right now, that says a lot about what the Flyers are trying to do and their willingness to do more than just trust the process per se and focus on the prospects from within. You get a guy like JVR who averages upwards of 25, 30 goals a year easily, proven goal score. It's one of those things that I think has to be added through free agency because you're not going to be able to find a proven goal scorer out of the draft. That takes time. You're not going to know who is a pro- proven goal scorer by letting them develop necessarily. They turn into that as their career goes on, but that that can only come with time. This is an instant upgrade. It fits the need of the scoring winger. It helps the power play out a little bit. There's certainly areas, other areas that the Flyers had wanted to address that they didn't in free agency, and we'll talk all about that as well. But Let's just kind of jump into it, guys. What was your initial reaction to this move and what the Flyers decided to do in bringing back, not only bringing back JVR, but going out and getting what was easily one of the top names in in the free agency class this year once you got past the clear top two? You look back at uh, the deal that Evander Kane signed at the end of May with San Jose, where he gets that, uh, that seven-year deal at uh, seven million uh, for a, a cap hit. You know, it, it's something where you figured Van Riemsdyk was going to get uh, comparable money. And uh, when I first heard the news of the Van Riemsdyk uh, deal, I, I was not thrilled with it whatsoever. I thought that uh, it's something where it, it, it just – it was going to, you know, just completely bog the team down. I thought it was something where it's just not going to do anybody any favors. Uh, common sense then stepped in, and then I figured, you know, this is a guy who can still flirt with uh, 30 goals a season. If he doesn't, he had 36 last year, and, you know, if he doesn't get to 30, he'll get close to 30. You'll see him score, you know, 27, 29 goals. And, you know, one of those guys who, uh, you know, he absolutely adds scoring depth, and that, and that that's been one of the, the, the team's biggest uh, woes over the, the past couple seasons. And something where I, I, I kind of wondered how I didn't even like it to begin with. I think this is something where – there's a there's a great fit here. It shows that you know Ron Hextall's willing to kind of open the checkbook a little bit and uh, start to build around these assets that he's developing and just you know it, it's it, it's a deal that doesn't uh, really kind of bog the Flyers down as Van Riemsdyk enters his mid thirties. You know it's only a five year deal, so it's entirely not the not the worst case scenario. I think it's something where it's uh, it's a great fit for all parties involved and. Uh, another thing about uh, the deal that I like from a uh, more of an intangible standpoint is you, you look at where Van Riemsdyk's coming from, you know, a team that uh, was basically building back from the uh, the ground up in, in Toronto, and it's something. So he, he kind of has that uh, that sense of, you know, what to expect out of a real rebuilding club. He's got that experience working with younger guys, younger talent, and it's something where he could be a real positive figure for, uh, for a lot of these younger players. I had a lot of thoughts on uh... – James Van Riemsdyk. One, um, I was trying to contemplate, you know, why Hextall would go out and 
do something that was not like a, make a conservative move. He was he's been a conservative GM this entire time, and he goes out and he lands one of the top forward free agents. And the more I thought about it, the more yeah, it helps with the push now, but it also helps with other positioning needs. Like the Flyers obviously needed um, a third line, uh, a third line center, an upgrade in that position. But what can happen now with James Van Riemsdyk? Like, he didn't sign a five-year, $7 million contract, a uh, $7 million annual uh, cap hit contract uh, with the Flyers, you know, to play second banana. Really, it really shows to me that they're either going to contemplate moving Drew back to uh, back to center and have him play with uh, James Van Riemsdyk because they had quite, quite the chemistry back in the day, or it gives them a lot more depth so he can play um, on the second line, potentially with Pat- uh, Nolan Patrick. It's, I like the deal. I like the fact that, because when I first heard heard it, I thought he was getting max um, max term. And so seven, it's, so I thought it was seven times seven. And I thought, oh, oh God, that's, that's terrible. He's going to be 36. He's going to be damaged goods by, you know, at least 33, 34 years old. And then I saw it was a five-year deal. So I'm like, all right, that's, that's more tolerable. He, he might be on the way out towards the end of that contract, but you're still going to get, like Rob said, maybe a couple 30 goal seasons out of him. He's not the prototypical power forward. He's a little bit faster. He added toughness in Toronto. He's not like John LeClaire where his back is suddenly just going to go out and he can't even get 20 anymore. So I like, I like the addition of him. I like the ability that he can just slide into the first line left wing and potentially move Claude Giroux to center. And you have him with Jake Voracek and some sort of like put all your eggs in one basket kind of line. I like the idea that you can then bump all these guys down, have Sean Couturier maybe second or third line center, Patrick uh, Nolan Patrick the second or third line center. It it's it fills a lot of needs without having to go out and get like that extra center, that extra forward, and can potentially get the Flyers more goals. And the other thing that I wanted to address, because Kevin, you mentioned this last week, um, when we were talking about JVR, and you said like, ah, he's really more of like a power play expert at this point. In the last two seasons, he's had 20, 20 goals, uh, at least 20 goals at five on five, which has been, you know, something of a problem for the Flyers of playing five on five and getting goals. That's a team. They've been a team that has had to rely on the power play to, you know, make comebacks, get goals pretty much at any time with a guy like JVR who can score you 20 goals at five on five and still get you and still be a power play weapon and kind of helps balance things out. The only thing that I really didn't like is the fact that he went from, you know, not really maturing into his body, then got traded to Toronto and did that and hit his prime. And now he's back for the twilight of his career. I I can understand that. And, I, you know, I look at this and I kind of want to refer to a tweet that I sent out on, I guess it was either late Saturday or Sunday morning, technically. It was still pre-free agency opening and all of that. But I, I even I even said something along the lines of, it, the price tag in the term doesn't look great to me on the surface, but this is free agency for you. Players want long-term commitment, and the only way you make your team better in the immediate is to take a chance on it. You know, I put JVR on the list of targets because of the fact that of of what he was. He's a scoring winger. People have clamored for a scoring winger for a long time for this team. You get a top six upgrade, 30-plus goal potential based on – not only what he was able to do at the start of his time in Toronto, but last year in a year where I kind of think nothing, not taking away from all the even strength numbers, but you look at the power play numbers he had and toward the end of the season, he was kind of getting phased out of the even strength play more and more. I I felt like Mike Babcock was losing him in even strength play because quite frankly, you had everybody else. There was a period of time when, JVR last season was a good five on five player for them because Austin Matthews was out of the lineup for a while. And now roles get elevated when players aren't available. And think about the beginning of JVR's time in Toronto as well. This is pre Austin Matthews, pre Mitch Marner, pre William Nylander. They didn't have Patrick Marlowe at that time either. So they try to make upgrades there. And I'm not surprised in the least that at the very least, he was on his way out of Toronto for the flyers to be that target. 
I don't want to call him completely one-dimensional necessarily, but I thought he was used in a one-dimensional sort of sense by Toronto in the latter half of last season specifically. Yeah, Previously, he had kind of well-rounded his game to be a very solid five-on-five player. There's no taking away from that. And only that last half of the year to me concerned me because you don't want a guy to settle into a role like that. His ice time has slowly kind of diminished over the course of the last few seasons. He was a 21-minute player when he first got to Toronto, and last season he's playing maybe 14 or 15 on average. So it's definitely a significant cut. I still like the top line the way that it is, and we'll kind of get into more of the lineup part of this and where he fits in a little while. I like the top line the way it is. I like JVR as a second line option with Nolan Patrick and and Jake Voracek for one big reason at this point to me. I look if 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 the top line was still Sean Couturier centering Claude Giroux and Travis Konechny, Giroux definitely had a resurgence offensively by not having to focus on the responsibilities that a center play centerman has as a two way player. Couturier with players like Drew and Konechny alongside was able to elevate his offensive game. Konechny comes into his own by playing with two very solid veteran players, two of the most veteran players you have with with the best skill that you can ask for on the team. Couturier's got all the two-way ability. Drew's a good two-way player who now is able to focus on scoring. I look at Nolan Patrick and Jake Voracek and not taking anything away from either in terms of both reached double digits and goals last year. That being said, where where does the primary point total in their point total? What's the primary category that they are leading in? It's assists. Jake Voracek is a setup guy. He's a playmaking kind of winger who is going to focus on the setup, maybe not the finish. JVR is the finisher. He comes in. You got a guy who's willing to shoot the puck a lot. I mean, every year that if if you go down JVR's stat line, every year it's roughly on average two hundred fifty shots on goal and about anywhere between 10 and 14 percent going in that's significant and that's a that's a finisher in that situation and who knows what kind of upside you're going to get from Nolan Patrick now that he's fully healthy gets a full off season to prepare for a regular season and gets to hopefully play an 82 game season if he comes in and plays an 82 game season the way he played the last half of the year look out that's a good that's a dangerous line too and so you can yeah, essentially, in a, in a way. So yeah, you got that, and I don't see any reason why you wouldn't try to pair those two together, at, at the very least. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've seen people throw Voracek up on that top line. I still don't love putting Voracek with Giroux. Nothing against their chemistry in years past, but I just like the balance of Konechny up there. It's, it certainly it makes it lack a little bit of size. Couturier's got the size advantage there. Giroux is kind of in the middle and Konechny's shorter than he is. And and that's n- not a knock against anybody. You can make that work, but that's a big second line right there with JVR being what he is. Nolan Patrick is a big forward as well. I mean, I don't think this is the way you're going to go, but if you, if you swapped it out and you put Wayne Simmons on that second line too, or on a, or at least on a line with Nolan Patrick and JVR, that's the size on that line is very clearly going to stand out I just think at that point you're running the risk of of having two wingers who are very similar style one who can skate a little bit better and is a little bit more of a five on five play driver than the other JVR over Simmons there obviously but I saw something in in response to the tweet about taking a risk on a player and I want to give a little bit of a shout out here um, be- only because another reason being that I w- I've been on their show before as a guest talking um, Flyers Bruins at times during the season, but the um, the Spoke B podcast retweeted the tweet and put a comment above it, and agreeing and saying it's it's very much related to um, when the Boston Bruins signed David Backus to a five year deal, and they're signing they signed him to a five year deal after as he was turning thirty two. And it's not to say that the production level is going to match, but it's a guy who two years into his time with Boston, he's going to be 34 next season, is still a key figure to that team's lineup. even Probably even more so now than he was before, but is still a key figure. I agree with that. It's And it's not to say Bacchus is more, like, you know, Bacchus is not the goal scorer that JVR is by any stretch. It's just comparing how 
if you want to get a guy like that who provides a certain a certain skill set who can contribute, who can fill a need, you may have to spend a little bit of money or give him a little bit more term than you're used to giving out. So you take the risk. For I think for at least two or three years, you've got JVR in a really good spot. He's 29. He's going to be. He's coming off of his of a career year, goal scoring wise. You've got him in a good spot now, and in the next two, three, maybe four years potentially, if he can still be maybe a 25 goal scorer in four years, it's a little bit of a stretch. But you you never know. You hope that his prime extends a little bit beyond into his 30s like that. If he can be that guy, as you get. Morgan Frost to come into the picture as maybe even, you know, you're for all we know, maybe as you're working some of the draft picks from this off season into the picture, if you're able to do that, that far down the line, then it's certainly worth it to have a guy like that around. I want to talk, um, kind of taking a break from the JVR talk for a second. Now we've kind of looked at a lot of his things and his skills and how he fits and all that type of stuff. Let's talk about three players in particular um, who were free agents via the Flyers at that point who are no longer members of the Flyers. One one was obvious. Everybody knew that with Brian Elliott and Michael Neuvert being under contract for next season, there really wasn't a reason for them to sign Peter Morazic. Um, for one – Resigning him in any form would have automatically cost them a third round pick as a condition of the trade that brought Mrazek to Philadelphia. So Mrazek signs with Carolina and goes into that kind of new goaltending situation there now that Cam Ward is no longer with the Hurricanes. So it's Scott Darling and Peter Mrazek are going to be the netminders in Carolina. Um, and that basically just saves the Flyers a pick down the road. It saves them a third round pick. Nothing more to it than that. It was kind of expected. The two players that kind of lingered, though, were Brandon Manning and, and Val Philpola. The two players there, and I say that they lingered because of the fact that as long as the Flyers had not filled the need of third-line center depth defensemen through free agency, the more it stayed in the back of your mind, as long as those two are available, they could be considered fallback plans. Manning kind of broke the ice on that a little bit earlier on Sunday because of the fact that with, with his, he tweeted out a message thanking Flyers fans. It's for a great, you know, for all the support through the years that he had played here. And that was very much at that point, the parting, the parting wishes at that point, you knew Manning was not coming back. Even, even though Hexall had said it much earlier in the, in the off season, when they, when the team broke up for the year that it was said then, but you, you're never fully convinced until you see that the possibility is completely gone, I guess. So Manning goes to Chicago, and he got a two-year deal with Chicago as well. So you have that. And then Philpola actually was on, was not signed as the first day of free agency kind of carried on. It wasn't a deal that was announced within the first hour, two hours, three hours. He's still very much available. As a matter of fact, the news that he wasn't, coming back to the Flyers and they were that the possibility of that was gone didn't come by him signing somewhere. It was Hextall saying after a free agency kind of after the wave of free agency kind of wore down that we've moved on from that. We're not going to revisit that at that point. That was the indicator that the Flyers were not a part of the picture anymore for Philpola. And eventually he latches on with the New York Islanders um, in their efforts to try to kind of kind of get involved in free agency after putting in the time and the effort to retain uh, John Tavares and losing out when he goes to Toronto in that case. And that certainly is an indicator of why Toronto didn't keep players like JVR and like Tyler Bozak and uh, Leo Komarov is another one who, yes, Toronto got the top guy on the board, no question about it, but they also had a lot of players who filled out that lower six in a way for them that that are no longer part of the picture. Now I know I know Komarov was not well liked toward the end of this in Toronto. People were ready to move on from him. But I don't I don't really remember getting a vibe that JVR was getting any disrespect or anything like that from Toronto fans as a third as a third liner for sure. I mean you knew who your top six were. So that would, there was nothing, no disrespect there. And he was good on the power play. And Bozak was 
still fairly effective as well. So as we kind of shift gears to the former flyers that have no longer, that are now former flyers, at least by signing on with new teams and just other free agents in general, was there anything to you guys that stood out um, in terms of any signings that happened or anything you want to say about the three players uh, that are now former flyers that were just mentioned? I'm still just wrapping my head around uh, the, the, the John Tavares contract uh, up in Toronto. You know, you, you always hear uh, about the, you know, uh, the, the, the Leafs fans will say, oh, he secretly wants to play in Toronto. You, you look at how many guys from uh, around the league from the GTA, you know, everybody wants to play for their hometown team. So the, 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 the Maple Leafs fans, they kind of get that in their head, like, oh, he secretly wants to play for the Maple Leafs. And it actually happened. Like, where else in, in history, in, in, in NHL history, have you seen uh, a, a top pick, a number one pick, who's just they're building this the team around this guy, and then he just up and leaves? I mean, it, it's it, it's incredible. It, something it, it definitely makes the uh, it, it cuts the, the, a little bit of work for the the Flyers. I mean, he's uh, you know he's out of the division now. You know, you don't have that kind of elite uh, presence in the in the division. He's you know, moving on uh, elsewhere, but it, I just, I, 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 I'm slowly but surely wrapping my head around that. I mean, it's, it's almost incredible. It's funny you say that, Rob, because I tweeted the same thing once the Tavares deal went through. He's going to Toronto, and I put out there, good news for the Flyers is he's out of the Metro, and that was instantly met with a, but he's still in the East. So, yep. So I, I don't know. I. It's it's funny if the if the New York Islanders were big winners on draft weekend one weekend earlier they were not very successful in free agency. Not that you don't have to add depth players like a Filipola, like a Komarov, or guys like that, but that's not going to take away from the fact that you had you were building this this thing around John Tavares and you had good pieces around Tavares. Barzell is great, no question about it. It's very deserving of the Calder and. You looked at other guys. Anders Lee was really coming into his own. Guys like that, Josh Bailey, players like that. And the their bigger problem was defensively and and goaltending. And they needed to build the back end more. They had a good group of forwards as far as I'm concerned. You know, I'm, I haven't even mentioned uh, Bavillier as another one. And he was certainly stepping up and making an impact toward the end of the year. They lose Tavares, and now you're trying to fill out the forward group Guys like Komarov and Filpola, while they may fill a need on the bottom six, they're not going to replace the scoring that comes from a guy like Tavares. So you've got they've got great pieces who can replace scoring coming soon. The Islanders got guys like in the, through the draft at least they got guys like Kiefer Bellows and this year Oliver Wallstrom. These are guys who are going to replace scoring eventually. But the key word is eventually. It, it, next year that's not happening. And same thing, you look at their defensive core and you go, the biggest thing they did defensively was re-sign Thomas Hickey and pretty decent. I mean, I I know they're still in on on him, but pretty decent chance that they probably won't retain somebody like Calvin DeHaan either, who they were already without through most of last season. You've got a great prospect in Noah Dobson, but again, I don't know that that's going to change anything next year or maybe the year after. So... While they definitely came away with a haul on the first round of the draft, free agency by losing out on John Tavares kind of changed their their short term uh, their short short term outlook for sure. Long term, they'll come back around. Obviously, I mean, you don't get that many good players through the draft, and if as long as they pan out the way that you think they're going to, you don't get that many good players through the draft and not bring it back around. But they were pretty big losers on that first, on that open of free agency when Tavares decided to go to Toronto instead, and 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 really, for lack of a better term, kind of drug them along through the process a little bit. It felt like you know if he if he was going to go to Toronto, I I don't know that I'm buying that it was between Toronto and the Islanders. If you waited that long and we're still considering your your team, your previous team. I don't get why it turned into such a saga if it was going to have that. And I, you know, who knows? And it, it certainly seemed like the Islanders were trying to do as much in their power to set the situation up, hiring Barry Trotz, trying to change the front office. It, it was just a way to try to set up a situation where he was going to be willing to stay. And that didn't work out either. 
So I just found it ironic that after being one of those teams that was right there at the top draft weekend, they were winners, no question about it. And then free agency comes along, they don't keep Tavares, and you're going, how's that team going to look next season? It's going to look very different. Yeah, uh, just to go along with what you said there, Kevin, uh, there was a lot of ire towards uh, John Tavares and his kind of dragging the whole thing out. I don't actually blame him for that because the man's trying to make a decision that's going to affect pretty much the rest of his life where he's going to move, obviously moving back home. If you're the New York Islanders, you can never let it happen like the way it just happened. That is all on Garth Snow. He had to make him an offer and say, you either take this offer or we have to trade you. You cannot let a franchise player, number one overall pick like that, just walk. You either sign him on July 1st last year or you or you trade him and you get a haul because somebody somewhere at some point is going to want John Tavares and they're going to say how much and they'll give it to you. You can't let that happen. It's not – you can say like the saga of that is John Tavares' fault, but it's Garth Snow's fault because he needed to be a general manager and all he was is just Mike Milbury part two. He, he needed – to do something and he didn't he sat on his hands like oh we can resign him like if you were going to resign him you would have done it by now he screwed up they had to get rid of him so they could or demote him to promote him whatever the hell they did to him in the islander for the islanders but they had to bring in lou lamarillo they had to do all sorts of last minute damage control just to be in the running because in all honesty i thought he was going to san jose because in san jose he'd be a number one center he'd bump you know uh joe thornton down a second line center he'd make this the sharks an immediate stanley cup contender rather than the like the you know dancing around the contender uh echelon that they are right now but going him going to toronto i don't know They're, they have two number one lines first line centers they have two first line centers how is anyone supposed to you remember that game he they, they played in, uh, earlier last season uh when he just uh faked Sean Couturier out of his jock on that three-on-three overtime? How's anybody supposed to... How, how is anybody supposed to stop that when it's John Tavares and then the other line has Austin Matthews? It's absurd. Or imagine mm-hmm. or imagine if you play them together in three-on-three. Three. You know, three-on-three, three, you do you do weird things with your combinations. Yeah, it's just an know? automatic it's, goal it, at that point. Yeah, like, it, that could be insane. I, I, I want to touch on your point that you made about how if you want to keep a guy like that, you sign him... July 1st, the year before it comes up, because it seemed like the biggest news that was coming out for a long part of the week, because the current, the market that was for this offseason was waiting for John Tavares to make a deal before a lot of other deals came into play. And in in a sense, they kind of lost patience with waiting because the deal, the deal for Tavares wasn't announced until about one o'clock on Sunday. And there were a lot of other deals announced before then, because by that point, that everybody was kind of done waiting. Free agencies opened. It's go time. That being said, the week leading up to was not so much, unlike last year, was not so much about who was going where and knowing a lot of where the active free agents were going. It was, look at the contract extensions that are coming out. Logan Couture, Drew Doughty, guys who were going to be up for free agency next year, and they're getting pulled off the market already because, perfect example, as Ron Hextall said during the week, Teams that have good players want to keep their good players. It, it, that's just how it works. So you're not wrong at all with what the Islanders did because you had this chance. If you wanted to keep your best player, your franchise cornerstone, then you make that deal or work on that deal long before he gets to free agency or you or you try to find a way to move him because you, you're going to get nothing out of that. So that's absolutely the truth. It's why, you know, it's why we're looking at this year. Look at this upcoming season, and to take to, to put a Flyers angle on it, look at Wayne Simmons. You're going to go into this year. You may negotiate a contract, but you're going to try to either figure it out now, or figure it out during the season a little bit. And probably, if you get closer to the trade deadline and you know where this is heading, if it's not, if it doesn't involve a return for Wayne Simmons the following year in orange and black, then it's going to be a trade because Ron Hextall's very smart about that and tries to get the most out of players like that. It's turning players into something. It's like it's like when, and this is not like a contract type trade, but it's like trading Vinny LeCavalier to LA and bringing back a, a couple pieces, even if they're not the best pieces. You know what I mean? It, it's 
at least you're bringing back something. You got something out of that player that you did not have before. And if it and if he contributes in any way, it's a little bit of a moral victory that you got something for that. You were trying to make up for a bad deal. It, that that's how it works. I I think that that almost certainly comes into play. So that was, you know, for all the I mean I mean my thing about the calling it the John Tavares saga and things like that is is just the fact that. You know, I, f- I felt like as it kept going along, we were getting ready for TSN, Sportsnet, and NHL Network to start putting the special up where he announced f- announcing the decision. You know, like it was it was borderline. It was becoming borderline LeBron territory with his camp is going is saying there will be news today. He's making his decision today. Oh wait, we're gonna it, it may not come today. Now, like that stuff is just ridiculous and stringing people along. The for the Islanders side. You don't wait that long if you want to try to keep a guy like that. You know that's your that's your cornerstone. That that's the piece that that's the piece that brings people and puts people in the building. That's kind of why I liked what they did. That's kind of why I looked back at the JVR deal that the Flyers gave him now, and I go, that's one thing I can't argue. You can look at term, you can look at cap, and you can go, risk is involved. You know what's not risky? Making a move that gets that generates a buzz and gets people in the seats. Possibly, scoring puts people in the seats. Players who have scoring ability puts people in the seats and making a move that brings a guy who's established in instead of telling people to kind of trust the process will put people in the seats. So, and it's not like they have crowd problems, but it's a, you know, but they don't have sellouts. Every it creates more of a buzz. Yeah, right. And, and Toronto, they, they love buzz in Toronto. Like it, they crave it. Even if Toronto, like they were, they were going to be great anyway. <laughs> Because they have Austin Matthews, they have Mitch Marner, they have all these young players that are explosive and talented. And they're gonna, they were one of the better teams last year. But just to add another elite piece to that, now they're just instantly like, oh, they're going to the Stanley Cup final. Yeah, you, you well, and that's the thing. You want to create a buzz around it, and and look at and look at what what Toronto is. Look at what the what the Flyers have in Philadelphia. Look at a lot of these places. If you've got a good hockey market, if you've got fans who are dedicated to your team, Toronto's obviously in borderline insanity about it because that's, you know, it houses Toronto houses the hockey hall of fame and the Leafs are one of, you know, one of the original six and everything like that. That's clear. You, you, you have fans that are really desperate to see success at this point. Same, same, same thing with the flyers. You want to see success and you don't want to be talking about a building process. So anything that you can do to accelerate the process a little bit generates more of a buzz. JVR is not going to solve the Flyers' problems and not going to make them an instant contender. But he's going to help, no question about it, especially for a team that you sit there and you – like, I'd love to see what JVR does in games against a team like Pittsburgh or Washington or teams of that nature who have been at the top and consistently are at the top. And I'm not trying to sit there and say, oh, when Pittsburgh plays the Flyers at this point, JVR has got – the ability to keep up with all of their speed guys and is going to make that kind of a difference. But you need to counter scoring with scoring too, to some element. If you look at like, like look at the playoff series, if you get handed enough power play opportunities, you better find a way to score. And JVR is going to add to the power play, whether it's on the top unit or the second unit, you've got enough players now where your second unit should really look formidable. Now, if we thought there was improvements last year, it really should look formidable. Now, knowing what you have, from your top six, even some of the forwards that you drop down to potential third liners, you know, because let's put it this way. We've talked about all these forwards on the Flyers who are all power play capable. Giroux, Katuria, Konechny, JVR, Nolan Patrick, Jake Voracek. You don't even mention, and, and just going over the top six, you don't even mention Wayne Simmons or Oscar Lindblom, and they fit into the picture. And then you've got defensemen who can drive play and be offensive minded. Shane Gossespierre, Ivan Provorov, Travis Sanheim. Got them, you've got enough pieces to to form two really good power play units, and they better be effective. And you better put them to work in that way, and make sure you take advantage of your opportunities. That helps just as much. One of the things I got tired of hearing over the weekend was, "Oh yeah, you know JVR, or whatever. He, is he going to stop the puck though?" It's like, stop with the goalie talk a little bit here. Everybody knows what their goalie situation is. Everybody knows who you're waiting for in that goalie situation. That's not why you make that deal. You make that deal so you have a goal scorer to go along with 
the kids who are coming up who are going to be good two-way players, the goalie who's going to come up who's supposed to be a, a game changer for you, the defensemen who are coming into play that are going to make a difference. You're building in a lot of other areas from internally, and you went out and you made one splash move. It's a move that just indicates that you're willing to do something with your cap space that doesn't involve waiting for a kid. That's that's the big step here. And to tie in James Van Riemsdyk to the John Tavares uh, subject that we were talking, it is absolutely earth shattering to lose a top two, a top end draft pick for pretty much nothing. You can see what happened with the Flyers when they traded James Van Riemsdyk for Luke Shen. And I apologize for calling Luke Shen nothing, but it's pretty much what I just implied. Uh, when they lost, when they traded away JVR for not equal compensation, it took them five years to get back. And they didn't have James James Van Riemsdyk last season, but they were kind of back last year. Like the last few years, yeah, they made the playoffs, but they weren't really competitive in their playoff series. This playoff series, they were kind of competitive in it. They're like obviously, you know, they got blown, the, they got their doors blown off, but they won a couple games. They had game six almost in tow, but then they, you know, collapsed because they're a young team. But you can see that the, this is a team that is trending up. It took them five years to become a team that was trending up because they got rid of one of their best, you know, one of their best blue chip prospects, even though JVR was already in the league for a few years. And now when you're the Islanders and you just lost your cornerstone, you just lost the team that you were building, the the player that you were building your entire team around. He's gone now. And now you have you have Matthew Barzell, you have a few young players, but you're not in a great position. And it's going to take the Islanders a long time to recover from this. I they might because they have Barry Trotz and they have Lou Lamorello might come around faster. But it's not going to be a it's not going to be good for the Islanders and it hasn't been good for them for a while. So it's 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 bad news when you lose that top player and it's I don't know if the Islanders are going to be able to recover from it. They've at least got a building. They're not going to move anywhere but Long Island. That, this would have been a disaster had they not got that building. This would have been a they could have been in a worse situation than the Flyers were. At least the Flyers made the playoffs a couple times in that time without uh in the time without JVR. But it's it's an awful thing to lose your cornerstone, a player that you picked one, two, three, and get nothing for them or whiff on them completely. For the record, wanna throw out that with if with that mention of Luke Shen, Luke Shen signed with the Anaheim Ducks this weekend for uh one year eight hundred thousand dollar cap hit. So just he would have signed with the Ducks, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> it almost it almost reminds me, uh, just going back out and, and picking up JVR, it almost reminds me of uh uh it kinda like how when, when Howie Roseman came back to the Eagles with a vengeance and he went out uh last year and went to bring Nick Foles back into the organization. You know, it's obviously a, a, a different sports, different kind of roles that Van Riemsdyk and roles each and Foles each played. But uh, it, it's it, when you look at it, it's like the the, the Van Riemsdyk trade was uh, very much maligned. If you look back at the biggest uh, uh, blunders, I think in the in the past ten years for the Flyers, the the the, the Van Riemsdyk for Shen trade is is among uh, one of the top blunders. And uh, you know when you, when you look at the uh, the Nick Foles trade for Sam Bradford, you know that's something that did not go over very well in Philadelphia. It was very much maligned. It was just part of that uh, Chip Kelly uh, dumpster fire, basically. So you have uh, you know Howie Roseman looking to to bring Foles back into the picture, kind of uh, work with the young quarterback in Carson Wentz, and now you have Ron Hextall, who's uh, uh, pretty much erasing that mistake from his predecessor. You know he's bringing Van Riemsdyk back into the fold to work with the younger talent. So we'll see. I mean. Uh, hopefully, uh, it has similar results to what happened when they brought Nick Foles back, but uh, we'll see. I don't, I don't know how the Philly special can be run on uh, on NHL ice, but uh, I'm more than interested in finding out. Well, I wanted to throw out a couple of names too. We obviously mentioned John Tavares as a guy who signed with Toronto, and that's one of the free agents, the biggest name on the market this off season that went elsewhere, got a deal. We kind of touched on a few targets that were in mind, and we were. This is one of the things that stands out to me about the JVR signing is that when we discussed this last week and we're trying to kind of go into and preview the free agency weekend for the Flyers, we didn't really talk about guys at the top of the list. We talked about the depth guys, the third third line center types. So we talk about guys like Tyler Bozak and um, just uh, Riley Nash and players like that, and then we focused defensively on a couple guys too. And 
the bottom line is that you looked at some of the deals that were going around and you go, if if you had to spend a significant amount of money on somebody, there's a few players who got within one or two million dollars of what JVR did as a cap hit. And I don't know that I would have spent that for what their role is as compared to JVR being a top a top winger, either on the first or second line. He's in the top six easily. So like you look at like Tyler Bozak. That was a three-year deal that has a cap hit of $5 million. I don't know if I would pay $5 million for my third line center. Just kind of got out of that situation with Philpola in a way, you know? And so it's guys like that. Um, Derek Ryan was an option that was discussed. Um, he got a $3.125 million cap hit. I'm just trying to – I'm scrolling through a couple of them. We talked about Michael Grabner as another as, – and Grabner's a winger – who has the penalty kill ability? He got three point three five million over three years, and the, the reason it's funny. I looked at that, and I even put in the uh, preview article that I did on the website um, for for Grabner in his description that he was going to probably get around three million dollars as a cap hit, and I think the term was a problem for the Flyers with that. If it was three years, not because and and it's funny. You're going to look at that and you go, "How is it three year deal?" bad for the Flyers in that situation, but they can do a five-year deal with JVR. JVR fits into the top six. You're making an upgrade to your top six. Grabner's instantly a bottom six guy that within three years, maybe you feel is replaceable because of other guys that are coming up through the system. You're going to have to find room for when Morgan Frost is ready and when other forwards, Vorobiev and Ratcliffe and guys like that. You know, As guys start to make their way up through the rankings, you're not going to want to have a guy like Grabner who's aging at that point who may not be as effective. Maybe he doesn't score 20 goals like you thought he might, and you spent $3 million on him and you have him for two more years. He turns into another Philpola. He turns into another one of these lower line guys like Belmar or Vanville. And it's not saying that they're not suitable for the bottom six role. It's, it's just as good of a place to kind of shelter up and coming kids who may have top six potential down the road as it is to get a free agent who maybe is effective for a year or two. That's certainly not Ron Hextall's, you know, MO about anything and things like that. So I look at guys, I look at deals like that and I go, I certainly understand maybe where they're coming from. You know, Riley Nash had, I thought Riley Nash, I thought maybe the three years was the problem, but I thought the 2.75 million cap hit being about and as, and as a center, I should add, being about half a million dollars cheaper per year than what Grabner got was possibly doable. But but even then, you clearly can see that they weren't going to be willing to go one or two years or two to like three or four years on any of these guys. It was one to two, probably at most. They weren't going to be willing to go more than that. And, that. and that's fine. If you feel like you can fill from within, so be it. I mean, there's there's certainly still a few options still – left out there in a way. I mean, you missed out on a couple guys. De- Calvin DeHaan still hasn't signed yet, and he's a guy I thought would be a good upgrade. But I get the feeling that you look at some of the other free agent defensemen. Thomas Hickey re-signed with the Islanders for four years. Uh, John Moore got a five-year deal from Boston. Th- things of that nature. And you go, if defensemen are getting four- and five-year deals elsewhere, that's going to be the target line for a guy like DeHaan and you're not going to, you're not, to me, you're not going to box it like Hextel said. You're not going to box out prospects. You're not going to box out Phil Myers for the next three or four years because you want to make an upgrade with a guy like Calvin DeHaan. You're just not going to do it. So that's probably where it's going to, where it's going to come from. It was, uh, and one of the things you just said when you were listing all the players, it was really polite of you not to mention Dale Weiss, who is currently just the 13th forward who's paid like Michael Roffel, but does not play like Michael Roffel. Well, it's funny. It's funny you should mention that because I was going to shift into the potential lineup picture, and we kind of we've kind of touched on this enough by now. The top six for next year looks pretty well set at this point, uh, so long as you as Giroux doesn't move to the center spot. I'd keep him at left wing personally because I thought I thought that that was the biggest reason for his resurgence as an offensive player. I'm not sitting there saying you go out there and expect 100 points next year by any stretch. But if you want him to be near point per game like he was before, he's going to be more equipped to possibly do that being a left winger than he is a center. It's a matter of why fix what's not broken. That too. It, it, that worked so well for you. And the, the bigger problem that the Flyers ran into down the road wasn't 
Giroux's playing on the left wing. You could have used him as, as a center or anything like that. It was, believe it or not, what, what ended up kind of sinking the Flyers in this playoff series that they had against Pittsburgh that was, as Dan said, that they were comp- you know certainly competitive in up to game six. And don't forget... You're more that they were more than halfway through that game at that point and leading four two, you know, before it all kind of fell apart and unraveled in the latter part of the second period and into the third of of game six, where you could have tied up the series and forced a game seven. No saying that you would have won that game or not if it went back to Pittsburgh, but it's it's the idea that you got thirty minutes into game six down three two in the series and had a four two lead, and and Sean Couturier at that point is playing on you know, on a bad leg, you know. So, you know, figure that part out too. So, well, the only reason I wanted to throw in before, because when I said you could have, you know, Giroux, Van Riemsdyk, and Voracek for a super line, like if you, if the chips are down and you're down by like a goal and like you have like, you know, a minute or so left, or, and maybe the lines aren't going the way they should, you know, you can do something like, you know, how Pittsburgh or Chicago would do. And you throw like Tavares and Kane together or Malkin and uh, Crosby together. You have that option now to just go, everything in one line and just go and see if it just makes the other team sweat a little bit. I think it also gives you flexibility in the situation that you see teams pulling the goalie with two and a half, two, two and a half minutes left in the game. And you could make up a group of six players because obviously you're going to have defensemen as part of that as well. So you'll have a Shane Gossesbear or an Ivan Provorov out there in those situations too. So pick five other guys that are going to go around that defenseman. If you're probably going to look at Giroux, Couturier. You could do JVR, Voracek, and and could either Konechny or somebody of that nature. And you haven't even talked. We haven't even thrown out Nolan Patrick and Wayne Simmons yet, or Oscar Lindblom yet. And again, th- those guys could be out there in that first set, first portion of that. And you go, so you play the first minute with a Nolan Patrick, a Wayne Simmons, and Oscar Lindblom. If they are not part of that last five, maybe. Nolan Patrick's on that last five in the last minute, and Sean Couturier's not. You know, whatever you have to do, you can put a good trio up front, still get a good defenseman at the back, and then you're filling the spots elsewhere with a couple other players. Or you do what teams like Washington tends to do, or Washington or Pittsburgh for that matter, and you got you've got Crosby or Ovechkin playing the full two minutes. Then you've got Giroux and Voracek playing the full two minutes, and you swap out the other four. You know, however you have to do it. In in the regular situation, I just like that top line to kind of go untouched because it did work so well. If if it's not, if if there comes a point where it's not working and you like the idea of trying Giroux back at center and you can put JVR and Voracek beside him, go for it. And that's not a bad line to use in a late game situation. There's certainly possibilities. I would like, for example. Giroux and Voracek didn't play on the same line for most of the season last year in a way, at times, you know, or if, unless Voracek was up on the top line, then Giroux wasn't playing with him. But when overtime rolls around, you're in the three on three, it was Giroux Voracek. Who's to say you don't throw a guy like JVR out there with Giroux and say Giroux takes the face off, JVR's out there to kind of drive that. It's, it's three on three, you know, who knows? Once you get past that top six to me, which is still any kind of combination of those six, Giroux, Couturier, Konechny, JVR, Patrick, Voracek, two pieces in the top nine are going to be Simmons and Lindblom too. At the moment, with nothing else happening throughout the rest of the weekend, I have Scott Lawton centering the third line at the moment. If nothing else happens, I have Scott Lawton on the third line. And then the fourth line would probably be some combination of Jordan Wheel, Michael Roffle, and another center. For now, we'll say Yuri Laterra, since he is an NHL roster player, and many of the other internal options that Ron Hextall referred to have not really played at the NHL level yet. I do think you could plug in Mike Vecchioni or Nicholas Abe-Kubel or somebody like that into a fourth-line role and get results. I, you know, Hextall even floated the idea that Jordan Wheel could play center. Of course, there's always the chance that Morgan Frost is waiting in line to get a spot. Maybe he's ready this after this summer with a lot of hard work. Hextall didn't sound too convinced of that, but you never know. So you, to me, you have options to fill the fourth line and not make it a liability through that. Maybe unless, you know, unless Laterra is still the center there, because I just don't see how that, after last season, I just don't see how that adds the value that you're looking for. But Wheel and Raffle playing like the wing on that, isn't too isn't half bad, you know. I think that's a pretty decent lineup, all things considered. I was even looking at it 
after the JVR signing went official and you're watching the rest of free agency run down, you knew Bozak was probably out of play, but what about a Riley Nash? And you thought about it and you're going, if Riley Nash was your third line center and it made Scott Lawton a fourth line center, and then you had the rest of the wingers lined up the way that you do, Lindblom, Simmons on one, Wheel and Raffle on the other, that's four pretty balanced lines. It's pr- looking pretty good. So they're they're not far off from having the four balanced lines they want to have. It's just finding a fourth line guy to kind of fill in there, assuming that you're going to give Scott Lawton the chance to be the third line guy, unless you're going to pop somebody else into the third line. What, what do you guys think about that? I've been playing around with the lines a little bit. And the, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to float the, the cloach route back at center uh, aspect out there is because if you have Giroux with Van Riemsdyk and let's just say Voracek or Konechny, we'll go with Konechny just to keep things balanced. Uh, then you can have Nolan Patrick with Limblom and Voracek. That was a line that was playing well t- uh, together um, last season. You don't quite know where Sean Couturier with the, is with his knee, and you might want to just you know, you know, give him a couple minutes to start the season, make sure everything's okay. You don't want him to get you know bang that up in the preseason or early in the regular season. So you have a third line with him and Wayne Simmons, um, and then on a fourth line you can have what I like to call the rush line, which is Scott Lawton, Michael Roffel, and Jordan Wheel, because twenty one twelve and also R forty was their last tour. Um, well, so you think for right now, that's if JVR doesn't get 21 back. Oh, that's right. He is going to get 21 back, isn't it? Damn. <laughs> All right. I can't call it the rush line anymore. I think I saw a tweet like that, that he said he was going to get 21 back. I, I, I'm I'm kind of curious at what number Lawton would get at that point, because he was 49 before, but they had Alex Lyon wearing that. But Lyon wore 34 with the Phantom. So for people, who, that's for people who are crazy about that sort of thing and really care a lot about jersey numbers. You know what, Kevin? You really just ruined my mood now. I thought we were going to have the rush line, and now I'm not even going to push this line anymore. <laughs> um, but for uh, but there was also an aspect to uh, the Drew at center scenario that I wanted to look into. It's just because, one, you have, you know, Drew, Patrick, Couturier, Lawton, Laterra is out of the lineup. And then that way you can throw, because you don't want Laterra on the third line left wing with Couturier and Simmons. He's just going to slow him down even though those guys aren't the most fleet of foot players to begin with. But you add an element of speed, so maybe you can put Danik the model Martell in there, or Morgan Frost comes in. And that way you add an element like they can score, and you don't leave Sean Couturier out there to dry after getting, you know, 80-some 80, 80 points last season. And also you kind of just, you trim the fat, because Yuri Laterra, Dale Weiss, I know they're making like over $6 million together. You kind of don't want them to be in the lineup Every single night, kind of just like, you know, we might need a center for this one, or we might want to put Dale Weiss in here for reasons that I don't quite understand. Injuries happen, Uh, you know, so. Yeah, injuries happen, but it's just, Dale Weiss had a really bad season. Like, I tried to defend the guy last year, last offseason, but he had a really off season. He didn't seem to have a role in any situation. I feel bad for the guy, honestly, but it's just. Dale Weiss is not the guy you want to be playing, and Yuri Laterra can have a pur- purpose. He was uh, he was killing penalties, but if you can bump them out of the lineup so you can put somebody like, you know, a Martell for speed or a Frost for potential, you know, all the better, especially for a third line. And then you have four lines that can potentially put the puck in the net. I like your suggestion of Martell because we, we've kind of – I've kind of been looking at it through the lens of – it's got to be a center who comes up because you like the way if it, if it wasn't broken last year, don't fix it. You know, keeping that first line intact. So Giroux's a left winger. So Couturier is still your top line center. Nolan Patrick's your two. And then either Lawton can be your three or you bring in another guy who you think is going to serve as a three. But Martel being a winger in that situation, first of all, he's definitely he's a solid play driver in his own right. When he, he had that really small sample size, uh, of his NHL time last season. And it's not like he was invisible during those games. He was around the net. He had scoring chances. Given more time and more opportunity, he might step into something. And he, and truth be told, we can also sit there and effectively say he's pro- probably part of the picture next year, not necessarily on the flyers, but he's part of the organization's picture because he was offered, he was given a qualifying offer. So there's no problem with that either. That some form of a deal is coming, probably a two-way deal, but that's not a big deal. 
You know, like it's not a big deal to have a guy like that in tow. It's a good guy to have in your system. So I, I certainly am intrigued by that option. I've always liked him as a player just because he's the type of guy that gets people excited in Allentown. He's a fan favorite because he's he's got a little snarl. He's He kind of has that Konechny, Marshand makeup, if you will, where at the AHL level, he's able to produce, he's able to score goals, and he's got a little bit of a snarl to his game where he's around the net and he's able to get under the skin of some people. So those kind of traits work well in the NHL. It's just a matter of if the skill level is high enough. But that's a name that I would keep in the back of my mind for sure. Yeah, I, I just like the idea of having, especially if you've got a line with Couturier and Simmons, especially if Couturier is still nursing that knee, you want to have an element of speed. So that was the first guy that I thought of because when I was – particularly it was a game against the Islanders. Again, we're bringing up the Islanders. Uh, he was flying in that game. He was absolutely – he was just all over the place. I was just like, gee – like I think it was like what? The first 10 minutes of the game where he got like two breakaways or something like that? Yeah, and he had, he one, was a, he had one stopped and I think he hit the post at one time too. It was absolutely – like I, I was wondering like how can you send this kid down? He's – just so fast he's going he's all over the place he eventually you know uh balanced out to where it wasn't quite like the rush that his first like you know 10 minutes were but if he's if he's somebody who can center his his game around and like hit that stride in terms of using his speed but also using it to come back and back check and you know being Mm -hmm. that player that dave haxall wants him to be because he's you know got to play defense a little bit then he's definitely somebody that i would have I would like to see up on the Flyers for next season in that bottom six type uh, situation. And un- well, and unfortunately, too, the, the case as the case turned out, he was sent back down to the Phantoms and then suffered an injury and was like fractured jaw. And when you're out for an extended period of time and trying to find your game and and certainly maybe you're a little tentative after something like that, you're going to get lost in the shuffle pretty quickly again. So hopefully he comes into camp with a little bit more of that mindset again. I liken it to an, and, and they're different players. So I'm not trying to sit here and say that one has the same level of skills as the other, but back when Tyrell Goldborn got his chance and came up and played at the NHL, that first shift he had on the fourth line produces a goal and he's, he's just hitting people. It's not to say he's a skill guy, but it's, you want energy guys. That's what the bottom six is all about is, is energy level, but using the energy level effectively. You're not taking penalties. You're being aggressive on the four check more or less. And lead, and that leading to opportunities to score goals. Martel could probably do that. Goldborn did it to some effect. He was, I thought at the very least he was a decent four checker. He didn't really have much of the play driving. He certainly wasn't going to give you skill, but he had a little bit of that edge to his game. You want to balance everything out with that. I That's why I throw out names like Mike Vecchioni and Abe Kubel because they are those kind of players. They're they're able to generate chances and also be effective four checkers and be bottom. They fit the bottom six role very well. For for me, it depends on if Frost is ready or not. I'm not sure he's going to be. I First of all, I wasn't convinced by what Hextall said it all then if if you still think he's got to put on a little more size and he's already gained 10 pounds from one year to the next how much more are we looking for here and if you don't think that's ready yet then I don't think he's going to be able to get much more in two or three short months when you have to consider him so I mean if he's able to put on five more or something like that and he gets closer to 190 and he's able to really work hard and muscle people off and actually makes noise in training camp because of that, then more power to the kid for working hard and getting to that point and forcing the Flyers to make no other choice than to keep him. But I just think that sound makes it sound like he's destined for juniors again at some point. Now defensively, because there's nothing because nothing else happened in respect to the blue line, you pretty much know what you what you have is what you have. So there's six healthy defensemen under contract, Provrov and Gostas are at the top. Travis Sanheim and Andrew McDonald are probably your middle pairing at the moment. And then Rad Kugudis and Robert Haig. Haig still got to resign um, as an R- as a restricted free agent, but he will be. And that's your sixth defenseman at the moment. Samaran is under contract with the new deal that he signed, but he's out until February, obviously. And that really leaves one, in my, in my view, it leaves one obvious internal option and it leaves one maybe not so obvious internal option that could be viable down the line as well. The obvious is Phil Myers. 
He fits the need of the right-handed shot. He's been, I'll say this, having watched him a little bit at development camp this past weekend, um, he's a man among boys at development camp anymore. He He's closing in on being NHL ready. His size is far above and beyond what any of these other kids are going to have. And you can't take that away from him. He's built himself into, a, and he progressed throughout the season last year at the AHL level, that he is close if he's not, making noise to be on the NHL roster next year, then he's going to find his way onto it at some point when somebody from that group of six inevitably gets hurt because it's go- it's going to happen. You're not going to have those guys stay healthy if they are the shot blocking type and things of that nature. So someone is inevitably going to get hurt. And when it happens, Phil Myers is probably going to be the guy. The other guy I look at internally is Mark Friedman. And again, development camp veteran, He's looked very good among the, the other prospects at development camp. He was fairly solid in the AHL last season without being a standout, and he's also a right-handed shot. I see possibilities there as well. What do you guys think about the blue line in particular? I uh, yeah, I do like the uh, the idea of Phil Myers coming into the fold. I mean, he's one of those guys that I watch him regularly, and I wonder how uh, 30 different teams – wasn't a 31st juicy to have 30 different teams decided not to take a chance on that guy. I, I really don't get it. I mean, he has developed masterfully and it, it just like you're saying, Kevin, I mean, he's, he's an absolute men against boys. I mean, that just and watching the, 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 the way that, uh, that he has developed so far is, is a real testament to uh, Ron Hextall's eye for talent and how the scouting department has, uh, has been performing. I mean, he's, he's just been on a real, I think he's somebody that I definitely like to see end of the fold and uh, we'll see how it goes with that. I, uh, I was sold on Phil Myers when I was at last year's development camp, when I saw the three on three tournament that he was playing in against uh, Jermaine Rupstoff. And those two just went at it for the entire overtime period, just going at, I think it was a two on two overtime. So you could even, pay attention more to the one-on-one situation that he and Rupstap are having. And it was just an absolute, it was like a boxing match. It just kept going back and forth, back and forth. So absolutely. If, if Phil Myers um, can show that he show that in training camp, so he can get the opportunity later on in the season, because that top six is pretty much locked up and Hextall hasn't, you know, put the final nail in the coffin in terms of free agency, because he has, uh, lightly mentioned that he might pursue a defenseman. He's done with the forwards, I believe is what he said. Uh, but he might go after a veteran defenseman because you kind of want a guy because you want Phil Myers to play in in Lehigh if he's not going to make the big club. So you want a guy that travels with the team. You know, if you're going to Edmonton and Calgary and Winnipeg and all those places, you don't want to bring Phil Myers along just so he can sit on the bench and not actually play. So I not I, unlike uh, Johnny Oduya's role last year. Oh yeah, and that was a and that was funny too because you know Mark Alt would have been great for the seventh defenseman uh, this season because like I really like with the way he played last year, I felt he was already taking Brandon Manning's job for cheaper. But then I think this was kind of a mistake on Hex uh, on Hextall's part by waving him, but he had to wave him to send him back to Lehigh Valley. So you know he. You got to play by the rules and you got to send the guy back so he can get some playing time because he wasn't playing at all because Brandon Manning wasn't going to get benched at all for for reasons. <laughs> for reasons. <laughs> but I, well, you're, you're right about that where he's not really looking for any more forwards at this point. He's keeping the window open for defensemen. I think I've got the guy who is most likely to be that player if they decide to add one for depth and be that seventh defenseman. Because the guy I see out there, and again, remember what Hextall said he wanted to look into, right-handed shot potentially, and depth guy, and somebody who doesn't necessarily have to be at the top of the board or anything like that. Cody Franzen's probably that guy. Unrestricted free agent can easily fit that seventh defenseman role. You're not asking him to be a key player, but he's also capable of jumping in and being an an NHL player. He has been for several seasons now. And I think that's probably a target for them. If they start running low on options and he's still available and hasn't signed, you get him on a one year deal for something minimal at best, you know, something around maybe you do one year, one mil or something like that, or a little more than that, but not much more. And it keeps a guy around who's available to, 
help out on a moment's notice, I would say. He's a bigger guy too. So even if it's not like a puck moving type defenseman, like a Sanheim or a Gostas Bayer who goes down or anything of that nature, if a guy like Radko Gudis goes down, he's he can he can go in and kind of take that size role as well. He's not the you know most physical of defensemen. He kind of does move the puck a little bit more, but he's still with the size. He can still take that porch clearing type role. Yeah, oh, definitely. At 6'5", no question about it. So really quickly, before we wrap things up, uh, development camp did take place over the course of the last few days. The on-ice activity started on Thursday and ended on Monday with the uh, annual three on three tournament. So camp has officially wrapped. And the next time we'll see many of these players is when training camp rolls around in September. Obviously there are, are prospects that people came to see over the weekend and throughout that part of the, throughout the camp and want to hear about Carter Hart, Morgan Frost, Phil Myers. And we kind of have already looked at Frost and Myers already and Carter Hart. I'll say really quickly, just is is clearly the guy who is drawing a lot of the attention and he does even in these drills which are not meant for evaluation purposes has a determination to his his own performances that will help him move up the ranks quickly i still i've told people this before i you can forget about him being in the nhl next year in my opinion he's got to play in the ahl he's got to become a little bit He's got to become a pro and play at the pro level and see the professional game in the minors before he's going to be in the NHL. But I wouldn't doubt that if he's either having a knockout year already in that upcoming season in the AHL or if he does have that through the course of an entire year, that he's maybe within a year from the start of this upcoming season away from being in the NHL, which is the timeline. Right around, you know, they were focusing on when both goalies have their contracts up and are free agents following the 2018-19 season, is he going to be ready? That seems to still be the timeline, and I don't think there's anything about it uh, that's going to change. Um, I was at development camp on uh, Saturday and Sunday and got a look at some of these prospects, and I wrote a few names down that we kind of have to throw out, and we already talked about the top three on the list as it is, but... Um, before I get into, I had and I had four, just four names that I wrote down really quickly, um, that were at the top of, that were probably at the top of the board or just at the top of being um, impressive type of players and things like that, or not impressive players, but they're they're the guys that you look to um, effectively every year, you know, or every year that they've been coming here as top picks, first rounders, maybe a second rounder thrown in there. But was there any guys that were on that development camp roster that you guys wanted to? have me kind of go into as opposed to the obvious players here. I I am curious a little bit because the last time we had this discussion about development camp was last year and I was a little hard on Pascal LeBerge. Mm-hmm. And he, from what I hear, had a tremendous three on three um tournament. He I think he scored I think he led the team in goals like for five. And yes. I think three came in very short short succession and two were absolute snipes. So I'm curious because uh you know, he had a really great season a couple of years ago in in juniors, and then it's kind of tailed off. So I'm 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 wondering where his development's at right now. He was he's got the the skill set to have that good shot. I saw him take several shots during certain drills. Sometimes they weren't even shooting drills; they were more of those. Um, because I'll say this about Myers to touch back on Myers for a second. You get these one on one drills or two on two drills where the focus is you're going to play until someone's able to score possibly, or like they let them go for upwards of 45 seconds to a minute and you're doing board work, you're battling. And sometimes the object of those two on two drills is to find a teammate, pass the puck to somebody and he might be open. And then that's kind of where the shot gets showcased a little bit. LaBerge has a great shot. Honestly, he's, he's really got a good release and his shot is, is fairly accurate and pinpoint and all of that. Everything else leads you to believe that there's still uh, – Hextall even said he's got to be more consistent and, and kind of fill that role. I'd like to see him get some consistent work. Um, he's expected to turn pro because he's 20. And if he's playing for the Phantoms even in a lower line role, I'd like to see him embrace that opportunity of being in, in, in the AHL and start to 
improve on all the other areas, be a little more physical, be a better skater. He's got the offensive skill set that he's going to go in there and probably put up a good number of points, but you want to see everything else come together. I don't I don't know that he's on the radar anytime soon, but if he starts putting up numbers and you feel like the game's coming around, maybe, but I, I don't know that he's anywhere close yet. All right, fair enough. I was just curious because yeah, he had was, those concussion issues. Yeah, and I mean, he, he certainly looks I – mean, I mean, you keep coming back to these camps every year and – you certainly come back a little bit wiser every year and everything like that, and you know a little bit more about it and what goes into it. I think ex- ex- experience does help him. I th- I think the concussion issues have slowed him down, and if he can just start to put all the other pieces together, he's got the offensive skill set that explains why he was a second-round pick. It's just a matter of putting together all of the other skills that are going to make him a good I – like, I don't want to call it top pick, but when you're picking a guy – either you know not that far out of the first round like they did you want him he's got to be up there in some respect so you you need him to build that skill set i am i am curious uh, to hear uh, anything on uh, uh david kasha cuz you, you look at his brother uh, andre who's pretty hyped in the ducks organization i'm i'm just curious as to what can we uh we can expect from this guy if uh, if there's anything similar he could surprise people. Well, it's interesting. He wasn't actually at. He wasn't on the camp roster this year. He was. He wasn't there. I thought I saw his name on the roster this year. He, if he, if it was, he was pulled because I think he was dealing with an injury of his own, so he wasn't there. There were a few um, prospects that had lingering injuries from their previous seasons in some way. Uh, Connor Bonneman didn't do any of the on ice activity. Um, I think Tanner Lashinsky didn't do any of the on ice activity either, and Wade Allison had had a major surgery. Um, to end his season effectively. So they were able to, I, I heard something about how I think it was Allison and Bunneman both skated and did like little, they were like kind of served as active, like served as shooters on goalie drills when it was just the goalies on one side of the ice, maybe. Um, but they weren't in the actual, one-on-one drills, skating drills, where it's a little bit more intense, things like that. They weren't doing anything like that. So there were a few players who had to sit out, and Myers, too, toward the end of it, had just a little bit of a nagging soreness that that, that forced the Flyers to just say, not these last two days. You're not skating the last two days. So take that for what it's worth. I just heard I just heard he had an, I, I heard he had an injury, and that kept him off the out of the out of the uh, off of camp altogether. But I, I don't know how similar his game is to his brothers at this point. Um, but I, I do know that from I do know that his playing style probably has a little bit of similarity to it. He's able to do some of those effective things in that lower role. He's as far as far as I know, I mean it's still too early to tell and, and it depends on how much you're able to kind of access that information as the, as a year goes on. You know, the, the thing the Flyers have a lot of anymore, there's certainly no shortage of European players in the system anymore. There were many, in fact, that were, I mean, they, they've got a lot of Swedish born players now. Um, for, for, for one thing in, in the goalie area too. I mean, they have plenty in that area, but you look at a guy like Ole Lixel, you know, and, he he looked smooth in drills, and he's a guy who nobody would talk about, but he looked smooth. Um, Hextall specifically mentioned, um, specifically mentioned James DeHaas and um, and Wyatt Cal- Kalanuk today. Um, just mentioning them as players who people may not know where they came from, they may not know much about them, but they had good camps. So that's just things to kind of to kind of keep an eye on and, and and know that there are players within the classes of the recent years that are lower round picks that came into this and showed signs of having good skill sets. And it's just worth watching. I, I saw an interesting tweet from Bill Meltzer about how in the upcoming season, just to kind of show, prove how the tide is turning and how many of these prospects are getting older too, the Flyers are only going to have, assuming Morgan Frost goes back to juniors, the Flyers are going to have five players or five prospects, I should say, playing in the CHL next season. That's it, and that's obviously it's a wide range, three leagues, you know, lots of possibilities in that in that respect. And to think about how many 
players are playing either in European leagues or college level or something of that nature. It shows you kind of the changing landscape of the prospect pool and how a lot of these players who were in the Canadian juniors are now going to be moving over to the AHL and turning pro. And the rest are more or less, many of them are American kids who are playing in the college ranks or maybe, you know, these Swedish players or Czech players or whatever, and they're playing in the European leagues. That's kind of the changing landscape of it. So I'll mention a couple more really quick because I wanted to get into a few more um, just before we wrap wrap up. And it's just it's just four more because obviously a lot of attention goes to the, the two first round picks from the previous weekend. Uh, and both Joel Faraby and Jay O'Brien um, definitely need to work on uh, size at this point. They need to bulk up a lot. Um, Faraby really – Faraby has the size that Travis Sanheim had when he first showed up to his first camp. And – kind of not a not a fair comparison because Sanheim as a defenseman probably has a little bit more height than Farabee does but it's not outrageous. Farabee's listed at 164 and he looks every bit of it. You saw Morgan Frost kind of get a little bit more size over the course of one year to the next. That's what Farabee has to do. His shot is great. He he's got a, a pinpoint shot and he's deceptive and he's able to do things with the puck um, that make him very threatening. It's and, and, and basically, everything I saw from Farabee shows that the skill set is absolutely a thousand percent there. It's playing against tougher competition and knowing that the size of players that are older is going to make a difference. And he needs to just add that size. O'Brien's not that different. O'Brien has a determination about him that is really going to get him far in the system. It's again, it's a matter of size. O'Brien at one point in time, I was watching the drill on Saturday when Myers was still skating and he was going to have to go up against Phil Myers. And and my, my initial thought there is you're watching because Myers had kind of roughed up a couple of prospects in, in the, in that drill already. You know, he, he had, um, I believe he had Matthew Strom, uh, as his one-on-one matchup for a previous part of the drill. And he finishes off the drill, not only managing to, kind of get a few shoves in, but he really kind of threw one toward the end and, and Strom kind of fell into the boards a little bit just because of just the force behind what Myers was trying to do. So I'm looking at O'Brien there and I'm going, good Lord, you know, Phil Myers is going to potentially kill this kid. You know, look look at the size difference. But O'Brien holds his own well. So take that for what it's worth and know that you got a hard worker in this kid. Um, and then a lot of people focus on Rubsov just as a, because he's a first round pick previously. It's interesting to look at Rubsov and you hope that as time goes on, he's going to continue to build on his skill set. When he does these drills, he looks very accomplished. He looks very confident in his, in his skill set and he's able to do a lot of things, but you just haven't seen it translate over to the junior level like you wanted it to. And Hopefully there's a little bit more of an upside in that in that area for him, but he's got the skill set. It's just a matter of do you see that come to fruition at any level? And I find it funny because in the same sense, Rubsov is a first round pick who we're kind of questioning. We're going the skills are there, but what but what's the potential? What what's the potential with him? You're looking at a guy who and then you're looking at a guy like Isaac Ratcliffe who has grown tremendously. He's already tall as it is, he's put on more size. He's got great hands for a big player and definitely has the scorer's touch. And quite frankly, I don't know if I saw a kid at at camp this weekend have more fun than Isaac Ratcliffe. He's got a smile on his face all the time. He's having a blast on the ice and he just is able to really work hard and do all of those things uh, and, and has a good balance to his game. And he still wants to get better and he still wants to be bigger so he can be more physical and bring kind of the size element back to uh, the NHL level because he he noted you know the NHL is certainly a smaller man's game than it was before but there's no reason a big player with a lot of size can't be skilled and he wants to kind of show that so he's taken tremendous steps he's gonna go he'll probably he'll probably be a junior player again uh, for one more year um, but there's nothing really there's not much that's holding him back from being a at least a solid pro in the near future and getting the chance with the Phantoms for sure. So any final thoughts from you guys before we wrap up? 
uh, one one further thing that I wanted to touch on. Uh, I'll be real quick with this. I know we're kind of running over time, but uh, uh, this weekend at development camp, the Flyers brought in one of the kids from uh, the Humboldt Broncos, uh, Ryan Stresnitsky. Uh, they brought him in, uh, you know, just basically gave him a tour around. He's been undergoing treatment uh, over in the city, and so just to, to, for them to, to kind of – you know, bring this kid in, you know, everything he's gone through, talk with the kid. You saw Ron Hextall get really emotional about it. You know, it's something where it's just one of those gestures that goes a lot bigger than the game. And it's something where uh, I'll give the organization full credit for doing something like that. You know, this kid's going through one of the most uh, traumatic and tragic experiences of his life, uh, as well as his teammates and his friends. And, and for them to go out and really extend the extra mile, you know, you hear a lot about Andrew McDonald. Um, you know, for his performance on the ice. And that is what it is. But, you know, he comes out and he offers the kid's family uh, use of his house and use of his car. And just for the organization to really go above and beyond like they did for uh, for this kid, I think it, it speaks volumes. And that's something that uh, it's, uh, I'm really glad to see. And I'll throw out there, too, for you, Rob, that as development camp wrapped on Monday, they had him back again as a guest at development camp. They took him on a tour following the camp of the Wells Fargo Center. Um, put it, put his name and his statistics up on the scoreboard as if he was a member of the Flyers. That's a cool touch. And he was, there was, they tweeted out a picture, uh, prior to Monday's three on three tournament at the development camp, uh, saying that basically showing that he was back to be a guest and watch the, watch the tournament. And he had two pretty cool people watching with him. He had Claude Drew and Shane Gossesper hanging out with him throughout the day as well. So that was pretty cool. It's remarkable. Dan, any final thoughts from you? We didn't touch on this too much. Um, I think Hextall, like you know, just to bring it back to a less you know uh, l- less serious topic, I think Hextall really dodged a bullet in terms of not bringing back some of the other players. You saw some of the other contracts that you know Philip Love, Manning, um, uh, Marazic had signed with other their other teams, and sometimes it's the contracts you don't sign. Sometimes it's the players that you decide to part ways with. I was surprised with the amount that Brandon Manning got, but he had a, you know, he scored seven goals last season. So with Ron Hextall, you know, playing, you know, usually the conservative one, he did the right thing in terms of moving on from some players and then bringing in a really good player. So I think in terms of what's going on, gone on so far in terms of free agency, Hextall has done a very good job. Absolutely. And that is going to do it for this episode of the Flyer Delphia podcast. We want to thank everyone for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Google Play. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll be back throughout the off season, so be on the lookout for new episodes coming in the near future. So once again, thank you for listening. For Rob Riches and Dan Heening, I'm Kevin Durso, and this has been the Flyer Delphia Podcast on SportstalkPhilly.com. This has been the Flyer Delphia Podcast, part of SportstalkPhilly.com, with Kevin Durso, Rob Riches, and Dan Heening.